Hello, welcome to Jason Cabinet Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. We're doing a crowdfunding campaign that launches June 1st. To learn more, go to https wefunder.com slash cabinetshr. Our guest today is Maureen. Maureen, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Very happy to be here with you, Jason. So first thing, you have a love for philosophy. Yeah. How do you get so interested in philosophy? I mean, coming from a country like Iran, where theocracy is the basis for the government and, um, and the big role that uh, they try to uh, play in our minds as a child, like to how, how you should think. And if you don't think that way, you're going to be punished for the rest of your life to eternity. I think that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to know more about this. Is that serious or not? Yeah. And so how do you move here to the States? From Iran. Uh, so I did my bachelor's in Sharif University of Technology in 2018. Okay. And uh, I wanted to do a PhD and uh, at the best of school for doing a uh, PhD in specifically power electronics, which was my main interest at that time was Center for Power Electronics Systems in Virginia Tech. And I had the opportunity to go there and why not? Um, so I came to Virginia Tech as a direct PhD student at 20 in 2018. Now, do you still have family over there? Yes, I do. And are you able to go back there whenever you want to, or uh, how does that work for you? I mean, I actually visited my family in uh, Turkey a couple of months ago. Um, I mean, I can go back, but uh, like the political climate in Iran is not that well now with a lot of protests going on uh, after a lot of disasters, uh, killing Masa Amini, which I, I think it's a keyword to nowadays that... Uh, government killed and people were angry about that action and it led to a few hundred more <laughs> killings just to prove that they did not kill her uh so <laughs> it's, it's crazy stuff uh, i mean um, proceeds were there right i mean there's so yeah but they there. have to pay to pay the price um yeah so unfortunately that's the price you got to pay unfortunately for freedom yeah. yeah uh but uh yeah iran's renaissance is going to happen soon too and like, obviously I've never been around, but I always heard like, a, like a, it's a beautiful country, right? Like architecture, yeah. art street, the nature and History, stuff. like History. Uh, you can see the remnants of Iran's dynasty like years ago. And um, I think it, it, it's amazing to see what we've had at that time. Like we have had like uh, human rights uh, being employed by our king 2,500 years ago, which is a big deal. So... Um, I mean, his story is good and bad. Sometimes I think may maybe people have too much pride in their history that uh, it uh, prevents them from moving toward future. But um, I mean, it's definitely for tourists, a, a very nice place to visit. And people are usually surprised how safe Iran is because although the government is very bad, it has been usually pretty safe. And uh, uh, you could walk out and like in the middle of the night with no problems, yeah. which Sometimes in some cities cannot happen in the U.S. Uh, but anyways, um, I hope some good things happen in Iran soon. So Iran has a, it's called a theocracy, right? Yeah. Do you think any chance of future that's going to go away or they pretty much have that on lockdown right now? Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so after the Iran's revolution in 1979, uh, people like, I think were deceived by the people who were running that new revolution. They were saying about things, saying things like freedom, but we're gonna be based upon Islam, which was the dominant religion of people at that time. And at least it is today on paper too. Uh, but um, they didn't say that they wanna force you to believe in Islam. And if you don't, you are gonna have a hard time. You can't go to school if you're not believing in the correct type of Islam. I mean, they allow you to go to school, but uh, I mean, life gets harder if you believe in things against their beliefs. And that's a terrible thing. So Iran is like, there's two types of Islam. I think there's one that's called Sunni and one that's Shia, right? Yeah, and I think there are other schools too, but they're the major ones, yes. Okay. And Iran is Shia, unlike most of the other Arab countries. Okay. And it's important to note that, because I think a lot of people don't know that Iran is not an Arabic country. Mm -hmm. Iran was, um, uh, I don't know, some people like invaded by Arabs after the Islam. And uh, so, so they, Iran, they, Iran is Persian, right? Yes, okay. they are Persian and they had, uh, their religion was Zoroastrian. Okay. So they were forcefully somehow, I think in history you can read that it's 
been a relatively new thing, like Shia in Iran was like 300 years old with the Safaviya dynasty um, or more. Um, I'm not that good with the numbers of history, but uh, so yeah, it compared to the history of Iran, I think Islam is relatively young. Okay. Um, what's something about Iran that the average American doesn't know? Of course, most Americans don't know anything about Iran. So. Yeah, most of them hardly know geographic map. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think like they're not Arabs. It's, it's a big deal to a lot of Persians. Like it's it's not that it's 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 not a racist thing, but like at least they want like you're white, you're not racist about yeah. it, but at least you want yeah, you want to know yourself as a white because you are like yeah, it, like, it's, like, you're, like like if you're Hispanic and you're from like you know Peru, you don't want to be say, hey, called a Mexican, right? Yeah. You want to be called Peru or Hispanic, yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so yeah, that's it. And um I think there are a lot of things. I mean, Iran is a great poetry uh, history, and uh, like Hayyam is one of the famous poets who a lot of uh, Western philosophers quote from too. Like you can read it in uh, also the journalist Christopher Hitchens' book. Um, so yeah, poetry in Iran is a big thing. When was the last time you've been there? Is it actually our end? I think it was uh, 2020. Okay, that's not long ago. Yeah. So when you go, do like do you feel like they're like watching you just since you're coming from America or anything like that, or that you just do what you want to do? Yeah, I, I mean, Iran is a pretty modern company, and most of the population are well educated. Like I think the percentage is crazy high of the people who have bachelor degree or higher. So uh, like if you walk into Iran, you don't feel like you are in a third world country. Uh, I mean, things have changed with this government because everything is going worse and worse <laughs> with this government being in charge but um uh, no uh i mean it, it's a definitely a privilege to come to the u.s and uh be free to think about whatever you want you're not afraid of doing things that are against the mainstream and i think that's that's what our people are craving for yeah with hopefully the new government that's gonna come soon yeah so next um how often you get to play tennis with all the stuff you got going on uh, actually, like last week, I played tennis three times. Oh, so, oh nice! Yeah, it's the, I have a lot of things to do, but tennis is the only thing that I can make exceptions that's for. Like that's how you take care of yourself, so to speak. The tennis. Yes, exactly. And I enjoy the moment. Like I try to go to gym too, mm-hmm. but that thing is so boring. I, it's yeah, yeah. I like gym is like in the first floor, and I'm on fourth floor, and it's hard to convince myself to go to first floor. But for tennis, I always have plenty of time. Yeah, and I. Well, people haven't played tennis before. They have no idea how how hard it is to play tennis, right? I mean, it's, it's really really good to work. If you're playing with somebody like a good opponent, yeah, it's a lot of it's actually a really good yeah. workout. And it engages the entire body. It's not like hands or yeah. feet. It's like you have to be good with everything. You should have a good speed. You should be good with your hands. You should have great stamina. Yeah. So yeah, it it takes a lot of energy. Yeah, of course you get to my age. You get you really can't play tennis because that knee might go the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, what do you do for fun besides tennis? Uh, I love cooking. I actually wanted to become a chef when I was like in middle school. Um, I had like 30 uh, cookbooks, half of them English, the other half uh, Persian. Um, and it still is one of my great hobbies. Uh, I, I recently I started cooking uh, like a lot of Italian food and also baking sourdough bread. So it, it, it helps me to... Um, relieve myself out of like the things that I like actually which I do for most of the day but like just to take my my mind off of it for like an hour or two so what is Iranian food what kind of what could that consist of I actually have made two a couple of times in our company too but so I mean kebabs is a big part like we have a kebab called kubide which is basically ground lamb with onion and you like it has a special shape that you should give it to with your fingers and also um what else we have a lot of stews which people find it very is uh, the food spicy there no not no. at all we're not that spicy yet. Okay. yeah and uh, we also have one thing that i found it pretty interesting to americans which is uh, uh crispy rice okay so the way that they cook it they, they, it usually has a, a very crispy crust in the end the bottom of the pot and that you can Eat it with stews or kebabs, and that that is a magnificent food to have. Uh, and I think that's probably most popular uh, main course or appetizer. It can be either way, but uh, the Americans find it. So, what's the food in America that you like? 
that you really like? So that's a question I asked because uh, like I guess which of this is like more American. It's take American. Some people it's mostly from Argentina. Or, yeah, that's true. Uh, but uh, yeah, you're I, right. You just really don't really know American food. But think I think it. what my one of my friends said that like Cajun style cuisine is most it's basically American. You can yeah. truly claim that it's American. I like it. Okay. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of steak, so I've had a great time here in the U.S. Yes. So what's the food that most Americans love? You're like, man, this is nasty. I can't stand this. Um, there's nothing uh, nasty, I think. Okay. But I think mac and cheese. I, I just don't cheese. don't. Maybe it's just the feeling of the guilt of so much of fat and carbs at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's the point. Yeah, uh, that's the point. Yeah, but it, it doesn't taste bad. But it's yeah. Just, okay. It doesn't worth all the carbs of that. Yeah. So in your career, you've written like around 30 uh, peer-reviewed articles. Yeah. What does that even mean, like peer review? What does that even mean? So uh, there are different types. Like I have a website and there's a blog which I can write a post on it and nobody will review that. Nobody, uh, there's nobody from whom I should get a permission to publish that on my website. But for a peer review, a peer reviewed article in science, it's a very important thing because if your scientific claims are not verified by uh, or fact checked by um, uh, credible scientists, the fellow scientists, it might lead to some misleading results. Like, like if you follow my paper, and my paper says that you should go to left instead of right, then your whole pattern of making to the final result will be uh, distorted by that wrong claim that I had in my paper. So, by peer reviewed, it means like I, I do peer review myself. Uh, like, uh, some people send me a paper and I'm Sometimes it's double blinded, meaning that. And this is something you do. People do for free, right? Yes. Okay. It's, it's like completely voluntary. And whatever and. Yeah, and and it it's good in in the sense for the reviewer that uh, it keeps you updated about the state of the art too. Like I do it. I, there's no money in it, but I I can learn and probably update myself too. Um, and yeah, it it sometimes it's double double blinded. Like neither author nor reviewer know each other. Sometimes it's single blinded, meaning that. The reviewer knows the author, but the author doesn't know the reviewer. So it can happen both ways. And like, you get like, you know, like higher, not super, like higher authority, the scientific community, a better paying job. What's the actual purpose of it? What do you, like, what do you get out of doing, doing, like doing all these peer review articles? Uh, from writing them? Uh, so first of all, it's just sharing the knowledge. And it's like, if I have a finding, and and the good thing about science is that science is not built from scratch. Like what I s start from is uh, like what my what other scientists have been doing in the past uh, years, and like started maybe from Newton, Faraday, uh, Nikola Tesla. All these brilliant minds started some theories and worked on different uh, uh, parts and. Um, equipment and I, I just build upon them. So it, I think it, it's my duty to, if I find anything based on their knowledge, in addition to that, I should share it with the community too. But at the same time, um, I think it, it provides publicity uh, for for the writers that, uh, for example, if, if for example, the startup that I'm working at needs a high voltage scientist who needs the expertise in, for example, partial discharge, then I, they can see that I've been doing serious stuff in this. I've been doing experiments, uh, and, and that's what I can refer to. Like, look at that paper. I've been doing that experiment. I've been doing that simulation, and you can check that out. So what is high voltage engineering? Uh, so high voltage, so let's say why we need high voltage at all. Uh, so we, need, we know that we need electricity, and electricity power is a product of both electric current and electric a potential difference. Uh, so why we need high voltage historically, uh, which Nikola Tesla was uh, pushing for, and now we have it all over around the world, is the transmission line. So when you increase the level of voltage, when you're transferring power, uh, you can reduce, like, you can think of it that way. Uh, so you have a certain level of power, and you can reach that power either by voltage or by current. So if you increase the current instead of voltage, you're going to increase the size of conductors. Like your wires need to be thicker. Th higher thickness means more copper, means more expensive, and more space that you need to devote. But with voltage, you can reduce the current and make things smaller. But high voltage usually leads to higher um, electric tension. 
which we call electric field intensity. And that can cause a lot of problems. Like some people might have heard like a hissing sound when they're in the proximity of transmission lines. And that's from a, a phenomenon called corona discharge, which is because of the high voltage. Um, so now high voltage has a lot of applications because of the same reason. Um, the electric aircraft that we are env uh, envisioning for future is going to use higher levels of voltage than we currently have because we want to reduce the size, we want to increase the power density, and we'll push for higher voltage. And with our company, Avalanche Energy, we push that to crazy, like 300 kilovolts we have in a device, 300 kilovolts to put it in like uh, a comparison mode. Uh, it's so our house uses a 120 volt output. So 300,000 volts I mean, I think, thousand times or 3,000 times higher voltage. So it's very dangerous, but it enables a lot of good things too. So I could be wrong, but didn't back way back in the day, didn't like Tesla want to do electricity one way and Edison want to do electricity? See another way. Edison was historically more for toward DC voltage distribution. That, that's what it is, yeah. yeah. But Tesla AC, yeah. and I think at that time definitely AC was an option. Uh, the the game is tilting a little bit uh, nowadays toward DC because all the renewables are going to output power in DC form, and your phone or whatever you charge with are DC. You store batteries, uh, energy in battery with DC. So some people are, have started to think like. Maybe we need to switch back to DC now that we have power electronics that allows DC voltage transmission too. That was not possible a hundred years ago, but now it is. So next, talk about this. Uh, you you received something called the Pauli Torgerson Graduate Student Research Excellence Award. Yeah. So oh, I think every university has one. Um, um, as a graduate student, like with your research. Uh, and, and you can claim that uh, in a meeting with other professors and students, then they encourage you to apply for such awards. And it's like that a bunch of students are presenting their work to a com committee and that committee usually takes votes and they pick somebody like me or some other guy. So what got you interested in this field of work for, to, to, do, to, to do this as a career? So high voltage in J stagnating in the early 2000s. Like some people were, thinking like it's almost done. Like there's nothing new we can say about this. Or maybe like we can't, we can't claim new things easily. So some scientists call it the dirty science because, because it's very stochastic and it's very hard to do experiments. So what made me interested, I saw that trend that we're electrifying everything. And in another, a lot of applications, we need to increase the level of voltage to get to compact sizes. And when we do that, we have a lot of problems. And when I come in with a happy face, I can help you with that. Uh, so I needed to develop that expertise. And uh, I think uh, I was privileged with that uh, choice when I was graduating because there were a lot of interest in what I was doing. Um, like Virgin, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say names, but like hyperloop systems need high voltage systems. Electric vehicles, uh, I was interviewed by two electric vehicle manufacturing company. Uh, because they also have, I mean, high voltage is a relative term. You can say one kilovolt is high voltage or even 500 volts, and you can say like a megavolt. But um, so in all the systems, we have some relative sense of high voltage. Um, so all these things need high voltage. And um, I think it was a good investment for me to go into that field because now there are a lot of applications I can help with. So how high does the voltage have to be for it to, for it to kill someone? Or, or seriously harm them? Um, so, so there are multiple ways if you want to kill people in, in electrical engineering. One is with current, like a certain threshold of, I think, a few milliamps will easily uh, kill somebody. But uh, so the way to think about it is like it, it differs from person to person a little bit because uh, each person has its own resistance mm -hmm. uh, to voltage. So um, it might be for someone like 700 volts okay. or someone might be a little bit higher, but um, yeah, can you show us somewhere? Oh no, so and so got hit by lightning like four or five times. He's still alive. Yeah, I, I think with power outlets, I don't encourage that people should do it at home. But yeah. it's very unlikely to yeah. kill you with uh, mm -hmm. power outlets. But um, higher than that, like a few times more, like 400, 500, probably starts to be deadly serious. So I'm probably saying this word wrong, 
But what is dielectrics? Dielectrics. So, um, you know, sometimes we have two materials that they can conduct power through each other. For example, we want electrons to flow through the cables and transfer power to us that you can charge your battery with. But sometimes we don't want that happening. Sometimes we want to have a conductor here and another one here and no electrons flowing in between. In that case, we need to have some sort of insulating medium. Air itself is an insulating medium or a dielectric in the sense that if you have, for example, uh, a kilovolt over a meter, it's very unlikely that you're going to have uh, a discharge flowing in between, like a, a stream of ele electrons flowing in between. But uh, if you become too close in air, like three kilovolt over a millimeter, you're going to break air. So this number varies material by material. And we have gas, gaseous dielectric. We have liquid dielectric, uh, like oil is a dielectric that uh, people use in transformers. We have solid dielectrics like cable. You see the shielding around it, the solid, usually white, or it can be in different colors, but you have something around the cable that shields it from the outer system. So that is also a dielectric, but a solid dielectric. Uh, so all these materials, have different withstanding levels in terms of voltage that they can tolerate. And uh, we want to make the most out of them for specific applications. So there are a lot of games that you can play, like using this one or that one, how their interface would work. What if all those things? So the exercise of high voltage electricity, has it been the same since the beginning? Has it science improved any or? Definitely improved. But uh, like what I mentioned about uh, some people mentioning that high voltage engineering is done is that like we were some people were claiming that we develop quite fast enough in the beginning that we don't need to invest that much time in it and for example uh u.s transmission system is pretty old and uh, i think part of part of that inspired administration pass is going to help rebuild that transmission system and expand it so that system for example is very old uh, and I, in one of my research i questioned that assumption that Conductors that you can see in towers of transmission systems, they, they're they symmetric. Like if you have three conductors that are like in an equilateral system that you can easily see the symmetry. But I was, I was questioning that. Like, let's say it's not symmetric. Can we gain any benefit out of that? And the answer was a firm yes, yes, we can. Um, so sometimes the systems are good enough that people won't question its like improvement or its potential improvement. But... Um, there's definitely been some interesting innovations. And at the Avalanche Energy, we have to do some of those because what we're doing is like nobody has ever done. So next, change particle simulation. Does that, does that still have to do with physics or that's still high voltage stuff? Um, so that was part of my duty in Avalanche Energy. Um, so, I mean, charged particle is everywhere in engineering, but sometimes we don't treat it as like particles. Sometimes we treat them as like a flow of, uh, a stream of electrons, let's say. Uh, but charged particle simulation is very important for fusion engineering and fusion plasma science as well. Uh, that like with fusion, your goal is to have two charged particles, like two nuclei that are light, collide with each other and create a massive amount of energy from the difference between the uh, mass of the resultant mater nucleus versus the summation of the two lighter nuclei. So uh, what I was doing with that was like uh, electric multi-physics simulation of that. Like, let's say we have the electric field caused by high voltage, we have magnetic field, and let's say we shoot an ion beam, and what would be the trajectory of that? So that was part of my duty in early days on Avalanche because we were a very small company when I joined them. I was employee number seven. And so people, usually in early stage startups should do different things. They shouldn't be like focused. Oh, I'm, I'm high voltage scientist. So I, I will only do that. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> yeah. The most startups all have that guy like using employee number seven. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I was doing a lot of things that I had an experience with, but, but it, it helped me a lot to learn more things. Yeah. So professionally you're the, um, where's it at? So you also serve as a North American representative for the IEEE dialectic young professionals, right? Mm -hmm. So first, so I had Mike for boys on here like a, about a month yes, ago. He's a great friend of mine. Yeah. So what, what, what is IEEE? So IEEE is, um, I think it stands for International um, 
electronics, electrical and electronics engineers. Uh, so I typically like it's, I think one of the, I've heard that it's like the largest academic organization in the world. And like it gathers all the electrical engineers in different areas, like high voltage is usually part of a dielectric and electrical installation society, the EIS. And that's just a small committee of that. You can have communication systems, you have biomedical systems, you have control systems, you have uh, electronics, you have all different things and machine learning. So uh, IEEE is a credible association for like connecting all those people together and providing a medium so, so we can you, you can share your knowledge, you can present those in conferences sponsored by IEEE. So it's like a home to all the electrical engineers of every background. Are you going to the network next Friday? The, the dinner on June 2nd? I don't know about that. But you know, so it, it's not rare to miss a couple of one. And then you also take part in something called American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Yeah. So that was because of the project I was doing uh, as part of my PhD dissertation. That was like, uh, you know, one of the major challenges with electrification of aircrafts is that at higher altitudes, you know, the pressure is lower. So the dilate the partial discharge or a silent killer, and I'm going to discuss, describe that in a moment, gets exacerbated at higher altitudes because of lower pressure. So if you design a system, for example, that laptop for, for uh, atmospheric pressure, it's not going to work that well high in altitude in terms of high voltage systems like this laptop is not high voltage. But uh, so that problem was a big thing because if you want to electrify aircraft and in the middle of air, something bad happens, it's not, it wouldn't end in good things because it's, it's a high, it should be a highly reliable system. And um, so because of that, I had some uh, presentations in uh, two conferences that were co-sponsored by AIAA. Um, and yeah, it was basically talking about how the short-term behavior of dielectrics that we can see with our measurement system can help us to understand its future, uh, its future uh, performance. Uh, and that was enabled, like I, I provide a connection between high voltage engineering and machine learning because machine learning allows you uh, with, for example, deep learning to detect patterns and predict what will happen next. Or like if you can find a signature of a bad event, you can apply it to next measurements too. So I used that to uh, predict the lifetime of uh, uh, electric aircraft dielectrics and uh, detect what type of fault is happening because how you look at signal and you can use the deep learning model and say like, this is the type of problem you're facing. So talk about space for fast. So the James Webb telescopes out there, I think, I think every day they found thousands more galaxies, thousands yeah. more potential planets. Do you think we're eventually going to find a chance of life out there? Uh, I mean, that's, that's a big question. Uh, I mean, it's going to be fun if you find it, but, uh, but I do mean, we want, do we want to find it? You know, uh, I mean, I'm always up for knowledge. Like, I, I don't think we should be frightened of finding out truth. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, I'm always up for it. Yes. So recently, I don't know how recent, but you're a guest editor of a recent advanced electrical system discharges. Are you yes. still doing that? Yeah. Uh, so there, as, as I mentioned, that stagnating field is being uh, expanding more and more. And now we need it. Uh, in other areas. So I was invited by MDPI, which is um, an academic publisher based in Switzerland to do a, spe a special issue on that. And uh, yeah, uh, I, I would definitely welcome anybody who has an idea and want to publish there. So next, let's talk about um, your, your startup. Mm -hmm. So y'all doing some really cool ass shit, right? Yes. I mean, I could be making it up. I think on your website, it says we're doing like, we're making science fiction come true or something like that. Yes, that's exactly what it is. That is exactly what it feels like every day. <laughs> I mean, just like, the, I mean, the stuff your company might potentially do is going to be like world changing, right? Yes. And uh, it's not only us. Uh, there are a dozen other companies uh, that are doing fusion. And fusion has been a dream. And there's a sarcastic comment about fusion that it's always 30 years away and the 30 years never comes to an end. Um, 
But um, in the past couple of years, I, I, I'm sure you've seen that there's been a huge amount of investment happening uh, in fusion energy. Like I think only in the second half of 21 until the second half of 2022, we had about, I think two or $3 billion invested in fusion, which is a, a crazy number. And I think uh, the private sector is gonna help a lot with uh, accelerating fusion. And what distinguishes us from other fusion companies is that, you know, historically fusion is targeting power plant size systems. Like they wanna replace a fossil fuel based power plant with a fusion power plant. But we, our configuration is very compact. We don't wanna replace power plants. Let's other fusion companies do that. But we wanna have a fusion reactor this small that you can employ. So you're talking about McAvoy and Tony Stark. Yeah. And, and, and there, there, there are a lot of great merits to that because you can, you can make things going fast. You can build it very cheaply compared to, for example, either the- Everyone first, can have their own energy source. Excuse me? Everyone can have their own energy source. Yes. Yeah. And uh, for example, one of the contracts that we have is with the Defense Innovation Unit. Uh, and uh, our goal is to launch a fusion-powered spacecraft in 2027 or eight, if I'm correct. Um, anyway. So that could be only achievable with a small fusion reactor, not a, a stadium-sized fusion reactor like what ITER is doing. ITER is an international collaboration between uh, a great number of countries and investing billions of dollars on it. And um, it was planned to be starting to be built in 2025, but I think that's delayed a little bit too. So how did Everlast Energy like the mission come on board, right? Most startups might have some like like a scientist on board, unless a scientist coming like, How did they convince you to come on board? Or is that or did you want to work at a startup during that time of your career? Uh, actually, um, I had five job offers at a time, and uh, it was finally down to two options: Avalanche Energy and a, a big car manufacturing company, which I was supposed to work on their electric model. And both of them were super interesting, but like. I had a lot of talks with my mentors about which one should I pick? This one is a corporate, I have a safe job, I have a lot of perks. The other one is super interesting. Uh, it, it could be a lifetime decision that I'm making by joining that company. And it, it may not work. I have to start looking for jobs. So at the end of the day, I thought I'll probably be able to come back to a big industry again, to corporates if I want to. But the fusion startup in mean, this stage and with this technology, probably not. It is still it, it is still a big bet because I think the failure rate statistically is ninety percent for startups. Uh, but uh, so we're privileged that like when I started, we were in seed round. We had five million dollars to work with, and we built our first reactor in less than a year. And we had our first neutrons generated. And as you know, neutrons are byproducts of hydrogenic fusion reactions. So if you have neutrons, it indicates that you have had successful fusion reactions. Um, so the, 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 the base is crazy, like about decades of investment of billions of dollars. Ours is like less than a year with 10 people. Uh, but we, we have a brilliant team of mechanical engineers, plasma scientists, uh, computer engineers, electrical engineers, all those prob uh, all those people are like great. So. So we have a great team, but yeah. I can't imagine the brain power of the company, right? I mean, I yeah. mean I'm sure it happens like super smart, if not genius, borderline genius people work in the company, right? Yeah, and I think what we need in fusion industry uh, all across the different companies, I think it's the case. Like it's not us, it's a lot of companies and I think their work is also valuable. And I, and I think the good thing about the culture in fusion industry is that it's not hostile at all. Like, like we were happy when NIF announced their uh, Q plasma greater than one. It was, it was a happy moment for us too, because the world that fusion is not um, impossible, it's doable, and it's coming. It might not be this year or next year, but it's coming. Yeah, back to you make a decision where to work at, right? From our point of view, you could go to a corporate job, Mm -hmm. Be safe, but you probably like one of hundreds of people. No one know you are, but the startup, like if 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 y'all pull this shit off, like the, the impact you'd be able to make, right? I mean, yes, the world changing, right? Yeah, it, it would be a lifetime achievement. As I will talk about 
<laughs> with my grandkids probably. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, and uh, I'm very happy that we, we were successful in our seed round. Um, we recently finally announced that we've you did an A round too. Recently, a round, like forty round. million dollars. Yeah, that's that's not small change. Yes, especially in this economic yeah um, climate. Uh, but yeah, that was great, and uh, we I hope we can keep improving our reactor and our systems. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to be part of the team at that moment because, uh, like, that was one of my first duties. That, uh, like, you know, high voltage feed through is a device that we needed because fusion happens in high vacuum. And for that, we need to track that crazy level of voltage from atmospheric pressure, or, or sorry, 10 to the nine times less vacuum. And uh, uh, so the most, the highest commercially available feature is rated for 100 kilovolts. So one of my first duties um, as an employee of Avalanche Energy was to design something new that can reach 200 or 300 kilovolts. And what we're talking about, the usual size of that feed through is like half of this room size. So there are a lot of iterations in design, manufacturing, and uh, I think that 200 kilovolt, I mean, we've designed a 300 kilovolt bushing, but the auxiliary systems are not still uh, ready for making it okay. to 300, but still 200 kilovolt was a big milestone for us to hit series A. Um, because that was the highest voltage ever a fusion reactor working at. And, uh, and this is your first startup you ever worked at with, right? Yes. What 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 about the start of life that you that like kind of surprised you that you weren't expecting that kind of threw off guard, so to speak? Like, so uh, I think the family like culture that we have in the companies like what struck me the most. I remember at our company we have a tradition at Wednesday that that a group of two or three or four people will cook lunch for the entire conference like my first thing i was like amazed by this culture oh because a lot of people think about companies time as like money so like if you take half hour of four people it means two hour and two hour times something it means like i don't know several thousands of dollars and uh, this company was like completely against that like we're not eight to five or nine to five people who are i mean just using time as a metric is a very bad way of managing people you should be very project-based. Uh, and, and I definitely feel that. Like sometimes you may work six hours a day and make great accomplishments with, with a high focus. And sometimes you can work 20 hours a day and don't do shit. <laughs> so uh, it's not always about the time. And I think our company is doing a great job in the culture term uh, to, to like make it a pleasing place to work. Like I always like crave for coming back to work on Monday, on Sunday, which a lot of people find it um, surprising, but it's actually what it is. Yeah, I'm a big believer. Everyone to work for a startup at least one time in their life to get the experience. Yeah. You're, the company headquarters is actually in a town called Tequila, right? Yes, in front of Museum of Flight. Okay. Yeah. So, what what kind of like safety precautions do y'all take? Because I'm sure y'all doing some dangerous stuff in there. Like, yes. I mean, uh, we have now a directory of. Uh, regulatory efforts, which I think he he's in charge of like, he's he personally is a nuclear pharmacist and he helps a lot with like preventing us to be damaged or be concerned about neutrons that we might generate during each test. And it's not only part of it. And I mentioned hundreds of kilovolts. So what, for example, we have is that we first of all follow national electrical safety code to make sure that all of our employees and our neighbors are safe from the x-ray and neutrons that we might generate. Now, do you have to tell like the people in the area what y'all doing? Like, like I don't, if you don't knock on the door, but it's like some kind of general announcement you have to make, like we're doing this, it's kind of dangerous. Yes. Not only we have doors around every single test cell, but also we have lights. And the system is designed such that if you even stand right next to the test facility, you're not in hazard too. If it is, then you have to increase the boundary to that level. But like an, an, an interesting example of that is our second prototypes, um, uh, I would call Vault, uh, uh, which is uh, comprised of hundreds of surrounding the whole thing. And you have different layers of lead shield around it that uh, like uh, surrounds the entire test article from penetrating outside. 
And the way we work with is that we have a Caesar lift that brings the uh, test sample up and we do all the modifications we want to make on it. We bring it back down with the Caesar lift, close the door, and it's basically safe up to the level that we want to do the test. But we, we think that these systems will grow larger uh, future. So one of my questions that I think you might ask is that you're talking about a compact fusion reactor of this size, and you want to put it everywhere. And now you're saying that you need 100 tons of ultra black cement flux uh, to protect people from against it. But that's true. But we're, we're not shielding it for the final product yet, too. So now we're still in the R&D phase. So once we figure it out and uh, uh, like, and we know what would be like the level of hazard, would be able to shield it from uh, whatever hazard it might generate. And at the same time, I mentioned about neutrons, but there are other fusion fields that are not producing neutrons, like proton boron eleven, uh, that is completely a neutronic reaction, and that wouldn't have the hazard. So if I our, our final, it might use that one. And if it does, then we're not going to have the serious uh, hazard causing by neutrons. So do uh, people like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission or other organizations like that, they, they provide you like a, a lot of oversight or they pretty much leave you all alone? I think it's very dependent on the local um, like uh, agencies. It's not very federal, I think, so far. Uh, so, yeah, I'm not that much into that regulatory things. Uh, that's probably uh, other folks who are like devoting their time to figuring out those things probably can better answer. But we're definitely complying with everything there is in the state and le federal levels. So, man, y'all do such cool shit. It's like, yeah. So, I mean, you do all like wake up like, man, we're like doing like real life scientific stuff. Like, we're making yes. Star Trek come true. Were like want to go to work every day and like this yeah and at some sometimes it does get frustrating too like when you're debugging some system and uh, it's not working in the way that you think it should do um so but yeah it, it's, it's just amazing to be part of this journey uh, and i exactly feel it as a journey that we're like there are different chapters that we're going through it with each other and we have bad times we have struggles we have some good times, like we celebrated making our first neutrons by going to Crystal <laughs> Ski uh, Resort, just hanging out and skiing for a couple of days. And that's basically one of our other traditions, too, that we do an, an offsite every season. So now, is everyone in the Seattle area? Yes. OK. Uh, I mean, I, mean I guess it's kind of hard to do this kind of stuff remotely. Yeah, I mean, we have a couple of other folks uh, who are like simulation guys are working remotely and but they're not 100 percent remotely they come in once in a while but uh because we do a lot of experiments it's not only on computers we need to be there in person to do the tests so can you give us like a I hate to use the word demo like a dummies 101 what actually is fusion sure um so you know what fission is um it is like you heat uh a nuclei with a neutron and it's gonna it's gonna experience that fusion reaction that you're gonna have two lighter particles and a massive amount of energy. So fusion is the complete opposite of that. So we we have two very tiny nuclei, like let's think of balls that you uh, collide them each other at very high speeds, and when they mer merge, they become a, a heavier ball or heavier nu nucleus. The, the heavier nucleus is not the summation of the two lighter uh, nuclei. And the difference in the mass produces energy using the Einstein uh, MC squared formula. So that is what the fusion energy is. So the problem with fusion is that we, we have been able to produce fusion reactions. The major challenge has been that like the, the amount of energy we needed to put in to create that the fusion reaction has been always higher than what we could get out of work for somebody to deploy it in a commercial level. Um, so, for example, what NIF, National Ignition Facility, announced several months ago with Q greater than one means that for the plasma side of it alone, they could put like 
one unit of energy and take more than one unit of energy out out of fusion reactions and that was a historical moment because it has never happened before uh, and um, it's still a lot of work that we need to do um, on each technology to make this work for for a level that it makes sense to yeah. deploy so the people i think i think the first time bomb was called a manhattan project right something like that yeah. So if they were alive today, do you think they would say, man, this is amazing stuff you're doing? Like, it's, I can't believe you're doing this. Or they'd be like, what took y'all so long? Yeah. I think they didn't think it would take this long. I think I was reading some historical stories about fusion that a couple of people thought they figured fusion out, but they found it, oh, we, we did not. So I think part of it, um, part of the challenge that makes it very hard is also what why it makes it peaceful. Uh, you know, with fission, you can have that mel meltdown or thermal runaway or chain uh, nuclear uh, nuclear reactions. With fusion, that's exactly what what is not happening. So it, we it's an entirely our problem how to sustain those reactions to make it worthy of the fusion reactor. Um, so I think uh, the physics is a little bit harder, and um, the loss mechanisms are more dominating. Than what we thought at the first uh, they would be uh so that's pr i think the major hurdle that we have fusion but we're still working i'm quoting from another fusion scientist um which i don't recall his name but he said like uh he was asked about this same question that like can this happen by that year or not and he said it's a trillion dollar question and it is in fact a trillion dollar question because what we need, if you can figure that out, what then you need is just deuterium, which you can find in seawater molecules, or tritium, which you can beat from lithium. And I mean, tritium is not hard to gain, but uh, all in all, it's way more easier to have a fusion reactor than have a massive area covered by solar panels or have, I don't know, fossil fuel-based power plants or wind turbine that kill kills uh, uh, birds that uh, I think President yeah, Trump complains yeah, about. People don't realize <laughs> about that, that wind turbines actually do kill a lot of birds. Yeah, and um, I mean, it is still, if it's the only way that we sh we have, we can save the planet with, it's still worth Some birds gotta die. <laughs> yeah, but um, if we can find an alternative like fusion, then I think that's definitely- Yeah, right. just like geeking out on a fancy land right now, I'm thinking like, y'all solve this problem like, do we, that, that mean next step is warp drive. We go to warm holes, black holes. Like, yes. I mean, like this, the, the, the possibilities, you know, like, yeah. Time, I mean, that's, I mean, time travel and all this stuff I think opens up, I think. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, that, that goes very deep into the yeah. science that uh, I think we, but we solve this. What can you, what can we not solve? Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, the, 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 the nice thing with science is that it always gets harder and harder and there's no end to it. Uh, like some people was thinking like, now we've achieved this, then we're done. Like what else we, could we want? Yeah. But now everything comes up. Uh, so I think I'm sure even if we figure fusion out, there are also going to be some other huge uh, problem, yeah, interesting there's problems. Always, there's always a problem to solve. Yeah. yeah. Most people don't 1894, the U.S. Patent Office actually said they should close down permanently because everything had been invented. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, like, I've heard about that. Yeah, too. it's like, are you kidding me, right? Yeah, it, it, I'm sure there's not going to be an end to it. No. So what are you doing? Like, how much pushback are you getting? Are you thinking you'll get from the, like from, the, from big oil in this industry, right? Because like, if it happens, like, what do you need oil for or all this kind of stuff for? You think they're going to try to fight y'all to stop y'all doing what you're doing because they're going to lose all the money or? That's a great question. I think uh, we're not focused on that yet. Um, I, I, th I think if it works, it, it's going to sell itself no matter what. Like we haven't even figured it out yet, but DOE is it's investing a lot of money and DOD is investing on us. And I think we're probably the only fusion company that DOD invests on. Um, so I think it's obvious that when you haven't pr proved the fit, that it's going to be uh, an efficient fusion reactor and p still people are interested, still they're investing billions of dollars in it. So I think... Um, it wouldn't even be us who are going to fight for making it work, yeah. like come to market, but it's going to be the big investors like Jeff Bezos, 
Bill Gates, all these people have invested, like Toyota invested in us, all those big companies uh, and big names are, are behind this. So I, I, I don't believe there's going to be any problem with employing that. So when you go home after work, like, this is my own personal question. Like, yes. how do you set your mind off, right? I can imagine, like, what a place like that. might always be turning and moving around. Like, I don't know how I would go to sleep. So it was like that for the first I mean, six months, I would say. But, like, I think human beings have a great sense of adaptability. Like, um, you, the thing is, I think if you can't take your mind off the subject that you spend most of your time at, you're not going to be efficient in future. Uh, you need to let your mind rest a little bit. Uh, what I do is probably, I mean, there are a lot of like peer review stuff that I do when I'm at home, when I'm working. Uh, also writing papers that definitely I, I don't have time for them. Uh, but uh, writing them at home, also watching TV, I usually do half an episode to an episode every night. Now I'm doing the new season of Rick and Morty. <laughs> hey, yeah y'all gonna make rick and morty come true yeah yeah that's so that's so cool like you actually work with rick and morty i mean the, the stuff that they do in rick and morty i think it's like 100 times more fusion oh yeah oh yeah 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 but uh yeah i mean no problem with that but sometimes yeah depending on the deadline that we need to hit i i might work like like last night i was working until 1 30 mm -hmm. but that's not usually the case yeah. i don't want to be like that yeah, um, I want to have the boundaries and that's going to even help me with work too. Like um, when you don't work on something and you come back next day, I, I'm usually like that I have new ideas. I, I look yeah. at it in a different yeah. angle. Sometimes it's good to get away from exactly. the following. Yeah. 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 So on your website, you're actually hiring someone right now. I think it's like a plasma or something. Yeah. We're always hiring. Like now. Um, Would that person be working for you or work for someone else? Uh, not for me, but I've actually announced something on my LinkedIn recently that I am actually needing a high voltage power electronics. Okay, I engineer. saw that. I saw that. Yeah. Can, I, you I, talk, I, can you talk about that real fast? What you're looking for? Yeah. So uh, what we need is to generate uh, hundreds of kilovolts in a very compact device, and we have uh, quite a few of ideas, and we're working on a couple of them. Uh, and we need some people who have experience with this to come help us because. So, you know, so you're in your experience, you're talking about more than a college intern then, right? Um, I mean, um, probably not an intern, but mm -hmm. a, a full-time coming out of college that knows about what we, what we want from him, from high power power electronics, RF, uh, DC to DC power conversion. It's definitely going to be uh, a useful thing. And I, I encourage everybody to reach out to me or apply through LinkedIn. And we're still looking for so Oops. what type of people, like suppose people want to apply, right? What kind of characteristics do y'all look for in your, in your hires? Um, technically or? In, across the board. Uh, so I think people uh, should have a high level of tolerance for frustration because. A startup life. Uh, not only because of startup, because like the nature of the science we do is very tough. Mm -hmm. like, like we're not reinventing the wheel. We're doing things that has never been done. And uh, I think we need people, I mean, like I was looking for something like this. I wanted to do something that people say it's not doable. And I want to make that happen. I don't want to do whatever people have been doing in the past. So I think uh, craving for doing new things, uh, pushing your limits. I love the people who want to learn more. Like- uh, Yeah, curiosity is like a big thing. Yeah, if you want to keep doing what you're already doing, it's going to be great in some sense, but that's probably not going to work in a startup, mm -hmm. uh, especially with this much of science going on. And so, yeah, definitely that one. And uh, having fun. We, we usually have a lot of fun in our company. <laughs> I think there was a saying that if somebody comes to our company and don't drink, he's going to have a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we have a fusion of triple F, okay. which stands for Friday Fusion Forum. And we had <laughs> one last night, too. Nice. And uh, we have, yeah, usually we go to a bar and uh, the company opens a tap and we always have a drink and we some good, eat some good food. And last week, actually, uh, uh, our first annual Hot Ones Challenge that we are. Uh, are you talking about? You're, you're okay. First we feast. Uh, okay. Yeah. I, I, love, that. I love that show. Yeah. Yeah. So I could never do it because I'm not good at eating hot, spicy chicken wings. A lot of people claim that actually, but. A lot of them actually made it to the end. Some people that were like, I think that's probably just like pride and ego, right? 
uh, I think I personally didn't think I would make it to the mm. land, but I like up to seven, it was all fine. Mm. I mean, but eight, wow, that was super yeah. bad. Um, That's so nice. But it was fun. Like we were asking questions, very deep questions that oh. we go in higher levels. And it was a fun experience for sure. Nice. So from your point of view, how does Avalanche Energy fail? Avalanche Energy can fail? Yeah. How uh, and there are a lot of ways that we can fail. First of all, we can run out of money. <laughs> and uh, we don't get the uh, next round of funding. Uh, but uh, scientific, I mean, if, if we did a scientific major bottleneck, like let's say this uh, mathematic, like so far, uh, I think all the fusion companies think that the science works, but we we can't engineer the whole thing. So it's mostly an engineering problem rather than a scientific problem. But let's say if someday we wake up and see the, this phenomenon, this loss mechanism, it's going to take a lot of power. I can't make up for it and the math doesn't work. Then, we just, But so far, both physics and simulations, we have a great team of simulation physicists uh, have proved against it that it still can happen, but uh, you have to overcome the engineering challenges. Okay. Next, can you talk about y'all's development philosophy? Uh, I think it's design, build, test, fix, and repeat. Can that, you talk about that? That's just like, it's not our mo motto, but it's becoming some kind of motto for, for us. We want to be fast. And that's what allowed us to build our first reactor within a year. Um, so uh, I can tell you a story about one of the pieces that I first designed, which was that 300 kilovolt bushing that's now patented. And I can talk about... Um, so I first come up with a design and on, in, in a CAD software and I go to our mechanical team and I discuss with them like, this is a good idea and we can work it out. And they back, get back to me like, this is not gonna work mechanically. You should do these changes and that. And I do these changes and we review that again. And if it works, we have a machine shop at, how, at, uh, at our company that can build stuff for us. Like we have a very complex dielectric design made of a ceramic called Maycore. And it, it has a sawtooth design on its surface that you cannot buy yet off the shelf. If you want to order it from a, another company and outsource it, you're going to wait for at least a couple of months. But when we have that in-house capability, we can build it like in a matter of weeks. And when we build that, we go test it and it might fail as we have a hall of uh, shame, which is fusion shame, <laughs> that we we put all this stuff that has been broken, like a lot of them by uh, me and other folks, uh, and like we 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 talk about the lessons that we learn from them. Yeah, I like that a lot. Most more people need to do that, right? Put your failures out there for everyone to see, so you can know what you can learn from. That's a great idea. Yeah, and, and what why we we're that much emphasizing on design, build, test, fix is that there are a lot of times that your idea works on paper also works in computer, but when you test it, you see Your things life. like- Yeah, there's... some variable comes up and you never thought about or- Exactly, like, I mean, computer is a great tool, but still it cannot stand for the actual piece to test it. So, uh, and I think a lot of problems for, for example, either project is that it's so massive that if you fail in the design of some component and you've just invested that much money and time to it, it's a hit, major hit. But let's say I've made a mistake in designing this thing. It's just another week. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not a huge deal. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, that's why you're focusing so much on experimenting. So what we're talking about doing, most people would think, okay, fusing, you know, energy saving, clean energy. But what's something else that would be like done with this? Uh, like what application? Yeah, application, yeah. Like some, something like people would use every day, but we're not, I'm not thinking about. So it could be the electric vehicles, like they have, they can have a crazy amount of range. Like currently I have an electric vehicle that has like 300 mile range, but it can be like 3000 miles. And that's going to provide a huge benefit over uh, gas-based vehicles and spacecraft. That's why DOD is working with us because uh, the solar energy harvesting system is not doesn't have the power density they're looking for, and Fusion can provide that for them. Um, yeah, so it, it might make it even easier and cheaper for us to go to space. So I'm pretty sure I know you answered this one, but like, 
a lot of people nowadays are negative. They're like, this is the worst time in human history, blase, blase. But I'm like, no, this is the best time in human history, right? The stuff we're doing, the stuff we're thinking about doing, like black expectancy is growing up, the scientific advances. Like to me, it's like the best time. Like I would be alive now. And then like hundred percent. I mean, if you think about it, even like not even hundred years ago, most people didn't have electricity. They still have outhouses, right? There's no, I mean, the advance we made in the last hundred years. I've been Average incredible. lifetime, uh, like the number of mort infant mort mortality. Mm -hmm. uh, for all those people that I, I totally agree with you, I, I recommend them reading Steven Pinker's book, Enlightenment Now, mm -hmm. that he talks about, like, he doesn't like talk about like what happened this year or like a couple of years ago. Oh, see what bad thing happened or that war. The wars are true, but the wars have ever always been here. Yeah. And the numbers have declined crazy down. Yeah. Uh, so what Steven Pinker does in that book is that he compares different ages statistically like mm -hmm. with different happiness matrix mm -hmm. like let's say lifetime we we like to live longer it, it's an obvious thing we'll we like to live healthy and we can cure disease that we, we never knew about them yeah i now have the access to this amount of knowledge freely and, and that that alone blows my mind yeah but like you youtube university right yeah exactly and also chat gbt now yeah. Now, that is taking us to another level. Like, I don't have to think about very ordinary things. It's just, mm. it's just going to be seconds. I mean, you use your brain for more advanced stuff, right? Yeah. For example, like when I was growing up, everyone remembered phone numbers, right? Mm -hmm. I can't remember phone numbers in my life right now because it's my phone. I use my brain for other things. Yeah. The same thing with calculator. Sometimes it was like a great like knowledge that you could do very complex <laughs> yeah. math uh, or uh, multiplication in a matter of seconds like what are you doing dude do you calculator no, it doesn't value at all it, no. it's it's not that like it's now focusing on way more important things so yeah i i know the threat that people are talking about of ai taking over i am not that knowledgeable yeah. at the future of humanity with respect to ai but i mean no one wants skynet to come right but yeah i i know that Humans are very adaptable, and they 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 have to adapt themselves. So, take fusion out of the equation, right? Besides fusion, what's what's some kind of new tech that's coming along? Uh, there are a lot of them, like uh, making uh, space travel financially feasible. That's a great deal to me. Like, I want to be able to travel to space. Some people think this doesn't make sense so right? you're you on the first ship to mars with, with elon musk you're gonna be in the first ship that, with everybody that, not yeah. certainly elon musk but <laughs> i, I want to go there i know yeah. that it's not a, it's not going to be anything there but it, i just want to experience it yeah i'm a big believer maybe not me but maybe not my kids but i think my grandkids we have the opportunity to go to space i'm hopeful that you yourself can do it yeah i would definitely go maybe not the first <laughs> ship maybe maybe number 100 but yeah. if not the first ship you know then walk some kinks out you know yeah and, and you know science goes pretty fast these days Oh man, can you talk about that? Like, what's the thing? Experience of growth? Because, like, oh, I said this podcast before. I listened to another podcast. I can't remember his name. The scientist, like, he used to play Pong video games and I have AI in like one, like one generation, right? I yeah. Mean, the advance of that. Yeah. It's incredible. So, so we can never say never with this uh, pace that we're going at. It's probably going to accelerate too. I think I'm 100% sure that people in the 1900s were also saying the same thing. The word is moving yeah. pretty fast. Okay, oh, man. I can't give up my horse for a car. This is ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I think we're all privileged to be born. Like, if you think about the chance of being born, like, uh, it, it's just crazy. Little, like, one in 20 trillion or something. I mean, being born here versus born born in, like, 1300s and, like, middle of Europe with a black plague going on. Yes. I mean, and, I mean, to be honest, still, there are places in the world that don't have a good life. And they're... Yeah. Um, yeah, no doubt. Yes, but uh, yeah, it's just, I think it's a wild card that we received to be here in this very day and talking with each other. So you would be considered like an immigrant, right? Yes. So can you talk about some of the challenges of being an immigrant when you came over here? Um, first of all, I think the United States uh, has a great culture of accepting immigrants. I'm sure uh, it brings if I was migrating to Europe or some other places. Um, but I think the major challenge for someone coming from Iran is uh, the emotional challenge 
for not only me, but for my family, because families are pretty emotional in Iran. Like they, they invest all their life and time in their most of their adulthood on their children. So they usually prefer to have them around, to be able to talk with them, to have them come over for a dinner. And um, it was definitely a big hit. Like I definitely remember the day that my mother find, found out that I bought the flight ticket. I mean, she knew that I'm going, but like the moment that she figured that I bought the actual flight ticket, it was. Oh man, I bet that's very emotional for both of y'all. Yes, I cannot and, and the that. and the airport, which was both emotional and funny because both my parents and my older brother were like crying, and I was smiling, and they were somehow mad because oh, we we're crying, and now you, you look very happy. But actually, I wasn't. Like I cried a lot in in, in the plane. <laughs> like I'm leaving forever, suckers. <laughs> I'm going to America, you stay here. No, no, definitely not. But um, I just didn't want to feel, I, I knew that they are having a hard time, that I'm going to leave them for, I don't know how many years. But uh, I just want, didn't want to add to their problem, but just feeling that I'm also in trouble too. Are they able to come over here to visit you over here? I think now it's not a bad time. Um, a lot of my friends have their parents coming mm -hmm. over, um, thanks to Biden administration mm -hmm. lifting the, ban that Trump yeah. uh, put it on us. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think they can. Uh, I might look at embassy appointment. And I think one thing that maybe some Americans don't know is that we don't, after Islamic revolution, we don't have the United States embassy. In yeah, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. So we have to either go to Armenia, yeah. Dubai, or Turkey. Yeah, uh, And that's like... So, it could be very hard for people to travel that long and like go yeah. there and get rejected. Oh, yeah. That could be a big hit. Oh man. Yeah. So coming to America, how do you, how do you do as far as a culture shock? If there had to be a culture shock, how do you deal with the, the culture change? I think for me, it was uh, b b being in a college town. I was in Blacksburg, Virginia, which is a very small town. We called it a village. And um, the environment of the university dominated the, the, the city. And that helped me to uh, like having a similar ambient than what I had in Iran when I was in universities. And people were super nice. And for me, it was, it was very easy because I found some great friends and I think it definitely helped because when you're coming on your own to another country, and if you don't have some friends, it's, unlike, it's not very unlikely to go crazy. Because he was always by yourself. But I had the privilege to uh, find some good friends, meet my girlfriend. And yeah, it's been good. So what are your thoughts on this? Um, so come on around, you know, tell low runs everything pretty much. Come to America, the politics here are just like insanely crazy, right? What are your thoughts on American politics? Like that, you know, like you have Trump, you have Biden, like all these left, right? People hate each other, right? What's your thoughts on that? I think it's a very complex thing. Uh, uh, first of all, I think... Like as an outsider, even if when I was out of Iran, like watching debates like Trump versus Clinton or Trump versus Biden were like hilarious. You're probably like, how are they like superpower of the world? What's going on over here? I, I mean, it was fun to watch, to be honest. I can, like, I can imagine. Yeah. yeah like like the, the moment that Biden said, like, will you shut up, man? <laughs> <laughs> like, um, so... Uh, I, I don't know why. I know that the country is very divided now. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think that has been what made America great mm -hmm. in the first place. Because like there are two totally different schools of thought working against each other. N neither of them get the whole thing. But I think the final combination of those two is not all in all a bad thing. But uh, I know that these days are not I know that a lot of my American coworkers are suffering by seeing what's happening in the political scene with Trump not accepting the election results and like questioning the democracy in this country, which I personally, I, I have no vote, but I find it is a little bit dangerous for the democracy yeah. of this country. Yeah. yeah, I've said before, like, as a country, we have to do better than Biden Trump 2024. Like, please, someone else. Please, first of all, can you be 60 or below to run for president, right? I mean, you just have to do better, right? But right now, it's actually going to be Biden Trump again. Like, man, like, but I read somewhere that countries get the leadership they deserve. So maybe we deserve Biden and Trump. Who knows? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's the, the feeling that you mentioned is the feeling that I think the majority of Americans wanted. Like, 
even Trump uh, Republicans may prefer someone over Trump, also Democrats, someone over Biden. They yeah. don't want to see that again. So what is your personal thought on that? Like, it's like, I don't know. So one thing I think about about American politics, like, like, suppose I run, 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 run for like any, any, it's just not president by any election, right? Suppose I run for city council. Well, you know, Jason Sips school in the seventh grade or Jason, you know, they pull up all these skeletal bones out, right? So if you're a good person, why do you put yourself through that, right? And mm -hmm. plus we have that career politician that run over and over again, right? The same person, right? Like, I think Senator Diane Feinstein from, Alabama, from uh, California is like 89 years old. She's in a wheelchair. Can't even talk anymore, you know? Like, I don't know. We have to do better, but I, I don't know. It's... So, I, I mean, I, I was watching Bill Maher. Yeah, I'm a big fan of his, yeah. I like him a lot. Yeah, and, like, he was mentioning that, like, do we care about, like, how energetic our president is? is isn't being president the, the major duty... It might be like you have to make quite a few good decisions, mm -hmm. and maybe the wisdom helps. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I don't know. In some sense, I admire Biden. Like with all the things that he's gone through in his life, with like his son, his yeah. wife, his own. I think he had some bad disease yeah. too. And after all this, being motivated to run for president, yeah. it was a big thing. And staying there at eighty-two. Yeah. I I don't know nothing about politics, but I want to be that motivated when i'm 82 if i get to that point yeah that's true it's, it's yeah who knows what's going to come about. so if if, I, if you were biden mm -hmm. you wouldn't run the next time i uh, i mean i'm a big believer that like people will say what they're going to do but you never know what you do when that's in position so i would hope i would not run but you know ego pride you know like and plus these five are like you know if they're gonna run against trump i can't let trump be president again right so i have to run right so maybe that's it, right? Or maybe someone's like, you know, quote unquote, you know, influence, right? Hey, President Biden, you know, he'd be the oldest president. Like, who knows what's going through his mind, right? Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I would hope I wouldn't run at that age, you know, like enjoy life. But I mean, like, I mean, on the on the public, it's not like he's like a decrepit, like no mental decline, but he might feel like he's a smart person in the world, you know, like, and he might have a bunch, bunch of yes people around, him, like, hey, you're doing a great job, you know. I mean, you never you never know what's going on behind the scenes. Yes, it's hard to know. But he might be like, I've been in Washington 49,000 years. I deserve to be president, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, definitely he has a lot of experience. Oh, yeah. Like Trump, I think, mocked him a little bit a couple of days ago that like he has a lot of experience, but he doesn't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I, I I hope the best things happen for the American people. Yeah. So next, go back to Avalanche uh, Energy. So one of y'all's company values is be weird. Talk yeah. about being weird. This is one of our coming... <laughs> comedy comments that we make all day like it, when when somebody's interviewing we ask our co-workers like did you ask him if he's weird enough or not uh, so i i think it, the, the story behind it is to embrace the uncertainty behind the thing that we're following we're i mean that's exactly what made me super interested in the technology because we don't know the end we don't know what's gonna be the last scene of this movie and that makes it very interesting so be weird, I think, is partly to, to embrace that uh, uncertainty, be able to do weird things to achieve that goal. Versus all the hundreds of thousands of colleges here. Uh, I mentioned that uh, I had talks with uh, quite a few professors in the U.S., and uh, I was mostly inclined to do high voltage than power systems or power electronics, but actually like to be high voltage in power electronics. So... The professor was like in the best power electronic center, uh, arguably best power electronic center in the world and the US. And uh, I, I felt like I should do it. This is the best center and I want to do high voltage. This is the best company. Is there any other science that interests you? I mean, biology. Uh, I, I read uh, Richard Dawkins book, uh, Charles Darwin book. Uh, I mean, not one book of Richard Dawkins, quite a few of them. But uh, yeah, definitely biology, physics. Uh, I mean, knowledge in general, like what is a little bit depressing to me is that how life is short compared to what I can learn. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but anyway, I have to deal with it. And so how long have you been with Avalanche Energy? Uh, so right after like three weeks before I defended my PhD. So since January 22, which okay, is about a, a year, year and a half. half. Okay. Yeah. So, so far since you've been there, what's something like you really like about, or really like, really love about working there? 
what is what I like most about it. Um, the freedom that they give that uh, you can follow what you like. Uh, so sometimes in companies or labs, they assign you to a project. It doesn't matter if you like it or not, but they try their best to let you do the thing that you like to do. Like I was working on a project as a, on a side thing, which I believe it would benefit the company greatly. And I just disclosed the idea someday and they were embracing that idea. So they're not looking for yes man people. And that's, I think, a great advantage to have. Like in the first day, they gave us our own credit cards. So we have credit to buy things that we think. Did you, you go to Vegas that weekend? <laughs> uh, so they, they give us the freedom to to buy stuff if we think they're valuable. That the trust that they put in you, uh, it, it's, I think, a, a big thing to me personally. Next question. If they made you CEO for the day, what would you change? Oh, that's a question I've never thought about. Uh, what would I change? Probably I would pay myself higher salary. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I think Robin is doing a great job. Uh, our CEO is a uh, Blue Origin veteran. He uh, he did. He's born in Canada, did his PhD in Germany, worked in ANSA as one of the great uh, multi-physics simulation companies, and then came to the U.S. and worked at Boeing for, I think, seven or eight years and went to Blue Origin and worked for 10 years and now working on a technology that wasn't like his main expertise, but he knows a lot about it. And he's, I think he's doing a great job. I, I think if you ask the employees of that company, I think probably everybody will uh, verify my statement. Who, who are your mentors? Uh, so I have two mentors. One is um, uh, Jim Horkovich. Um, which is a, a, I think is retired at Air Force. He was professor, I think, at Air Force University. And also another one, Kamiyar Karimi, who worked at uh, Blue, uh, sorry, Boeing for 32 years and retired a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, I get a lot of great advice from those two people. So next part of the question, to me, the more important part, who are you mentoring? Who am I mentoring? Quite a few people. One of them is my cousin, who is is uh, college uh, and uh, she, I mean I mean studying during COVID not being able to go to school and all those problems and she's in Iran was a big problem and in Iran we have a, a national entrance exam for university uh, <laughs> basically everybody can get to university uh, so we have both public and private and in public which is the better university uh, I mean there are but they are free and they're harder to get in. So usually there are hundreds, hundreds of thousands of participants fighting with each other uh, over a four hour exam that has physics questions, mathematics, chemistry, literature, English, all those things. And uh, it's a very tough exam. Like, like whatever you learn in 12 years of school, you have to answer in that exam. And, um, so, so it could be anything, subject, anything in, from 12 years. Yes. That's craziness. Yeah. But it's mostly like if you're doing a mathematics field, it's mostly physics, chemistry, and math. And it's, they're pretty hard questions. Um, so it's like uh, it, it, it's a gold ticket for you if you get into, for example, Sharif University that I did. Like there was an interview by Stanford president, and I think it was 10 years ago, that he said, the best electrical engineer graduates are coming from Sharif University. And uh, they usually get at least a few of them every year. Because like, I mean, the, the computer science has changed the game a little bit, but traditionally the hundred best students in math in Iran would go to electrical engineering department, like the, the most brilliant minds, like Olympiad, math, like the highest talents would go into electrical engineering and like Stanford, MIT, um, I myself went to the best spot I could find in the U.S. Um, so there are a lot of pressure on students to go into that university or other credible universities. And I'm mentoring a couple of few of my friends and family members to allow, like, enable them to overcome the stress and pressure you're undergoing. A few of my uh, 
friends who are uh, applying for PhD positions, um, I'm mentoring them. What age were you when you start becoming interested in science? Uh, I loved math from the beginning. Like, I think probably I've only lost... I didn't score the full mark in math probably a couple of times in my life because I, I loved math so much that I was always interested in that. Um, so I, I can't remember the start date. I mean, probably I would say middle school, like 10 or 11. Uh, but uh, I was usually mostly interested in pure math. I was not into spaces stuff that much. So let's say there's somebody out there 10 years old and they're interested in science. What advice do you have for them? Like to to follow their passion, like learn to be a scientist, like at that young age, what do you tell them? Uh, I think follow their curiosity is the big thing. Like, uh, and and don't don't expect that things will go easy. If you want to great, I, that's what I still tell myself. But if you want to achieve great things, you have to be patient. You have to allow yourself to deal with problems over and over again, because uh, valuable things doesn't come easy. Uh, so it's, uh, I think, patience and perseverance, the most important factors in my mind. For that. From your point of view, what makes someone a great scientist? I mean, it, it's a very general question. It's hard to answer, but the uh, um, way that they judge things, how they judge their findings, it can happen quiet in your life if you're a scientist that you can convince yourself that something is an answer to a problem, which is not the case. So being critical of what you, your own findings, I think make, makes, makes great sound ingredient. You have to be smart, you have to be patient, and you have to have resources. Like for Fusion, let's say we didn't have the money to do the experiments, we could have achieved nothing. So it's not, um, some people say like chance plays no role in life. I, I was always one of them before too, but there is still like the chance still plays a few percentage of role in achieving great things. So even very famous scientists, I think, have had their own fair share of chance to achieving great things. Can someone be too smart? What I mean, like, can you be so smart, like, you're not able to like, communicate stuff at a, at a latest level? That doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Like solving the problem of describing a problem, mm -hmm. it's usually easier than solving the problem okay. itself. Um, I, I think that's just a public image of mm -hmm. scientists and they are nerd and like they, <laughs> they can't communicate. It's enough, yeah. but not being able to communicate, I don't believe that much. Okay. So what are some of your career goals? Like, do you want to like get a Nobel Prize for nuclear fission in the future? Like what's your, like, what do you, I mean, everyone has career goals, something they, they want to do in the future. Like, what do you want to do? So first of all, I'm not a physicist per se, but um, I always believe that if somebody be focused so, so much on destination, he wouldn't make it there. Mm -hmm. Einstein was planning for Nobel Prize or Marie Curie when, she was doing the test on radioactive materials was like actually thinking, oh, I should do this. I can win Nobel Prize. I, I think the prizes and the money and your salary and everything you get should come as a side product of what you're doing. Not, it shouldn't be the main focus. And I'm not saying it's just saying a nice thing. I think it's actually what it is. Because if you're too much focused on your final destination and what you can get, you're, you're losing the mainstream. You're losing the base the more important thing that needs your focus. It means you're not focused enough. And I think uh, that that's a bad habit to have. I mean, it's good to dream. I always dream yeah. about what I can achieve. Like, let's say fusion happens, or let's say I start a company that does that. But uh, I can't be spending too much on things that are not tangible and be hopeful that they will happen. So is there any scientists, like either dead or alive, that you want to like, hang out with it for 30 minutes, an hour, just like, I hate, to use a, use, I hate to use the term pick their brain, but like, you know, pick their brain, so to speak. I think it have to be, it has to be either, I think Stephen Hawking mm -hmm. or Einstein. Okay. Uh, but uh, I don't know if it, 
30 minutes is going to be enough. Yeah, it will be enough. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what's your point of view on this, right? Like, do you think the human race is, human race is getting smarter over the years or we're like the same intelligence level? Like if you took someone like the year 800, could you put him a day and he like pick everything up, be, be as smart as we are? Or do you think we're just like advanced, we've advanced technology, but like not really as, as being smart? Uh, I, I, the, the word smart is not that clear to me. Like maybe sometimes we misinterpret smart versus uh, problem solver, solver versus uh, hardworking. Because uh, I always tell myself uh, that like, um, if somebody is a smart, let's say, hypothetically, I'm smart. But if I don't put enough effort into using that smartness into doing things, it wouldn't do anything. So I think being smart, like having a good level of IQ is a requirement, but it's not everything. So it's just one of the elements that can help people pick up things pretty quickly. But if you don't have the knowledge, let's say, let's say you're smart, but you don't have the background, just you can't make that judgment. You can't like, like, let's say, I, I'm sure there have been people smarter than Einstein, but they haven't been able to find that uh, they haven't made the discovery he had made, partly because we're, they were not physicists. So you can't expect somebody who doesn't have the background, but smart enough to make, to make it to the last place. So for sure, you, have, you should have at least the minimum smartest need to do the job, but at the same time, you should be curious serious threat and uh, be patient. How, how do we fix that, right? Cause like, how do you like recognize town? Like suppose like, like there's some young girl, like 13 years old, we're saying like a small town, Arkansas. She's a high IQ, she's like scientific inclined, but like there's nothing scientific around her. Like she lives on a farm, right? Like how do we identify these people, right? I mean, I don't think, I mean, tests don't really do a good job at that, you know, I'm like. Yeah, that, that, that's a sad thing to think about. Uh, and it's hard to overcome that. And, and like in Arkansas, you're a young lady, like 14 years old, you want to be science, they're like, go milk the cow or something, right? I mean, there's no time for science, right? Like, yeah, and, and sometimes the, it's not the only problem. The problem is that the ideology that their, their yes, brain has been yeah. washed with over and over, like, what is the correct life? Mm -hmm. What should be the value? Mm -hmm. um, it's so changed, like, even if you have the IQ, you, you're so deep into the mud of like those beliefs that you can't take yourself out, even yeah. if you have the opportunity. Um, I mean, I, I've spoken to quite a few people who I think could do a great job, but they were saying, look, I'm fine with where I am. I, I don't want to go anywhere. I think I'm made for this. Yeah. So just convincing yourself that this is all you can do, it's a very sad thing to me. Um, I think people should always be hungry for pushing the boundaries. And like I have a fa favorite soccer team. Ace Roma and their motto is hungry for glory. Mm -hmm. I think people should be always hungry for yeah. glory. Glory doesn't mean like money or cops, but just working in the path that you always like to work at. So your person, how do you make sure you keep up to speed on all like the all, all the like scientific stuff you need to know about? That's a good question. It's becoming harder and harder for me because like when you have very small projects going on. Um, you have to make management decisions. You have to hire people. And at the same time, you have a life that uh, your personal life that you should spend time on it. Sometimes um, it's hard to manage, but uh, uh, I, I think I'm recognizing the value of being organized more and more these days. Like I, I wasn't using any apps for like organizing things, writing down my, my tasks or like Eisenhower Tower saying, what are my main priorities? What should I achieve today? And most importantly, what I should not do today, because there are other important things actually, which it's better not to do when you have a higher priority. So some people, and I was, I think one of those people at some point that couldn't make the distinction between a high priority item and a higher priority item. And you should always sacrifice something. We have limited amount of time. And I think that's important. So let's take yourself like 10 years ago, right? Your 10 year old self, do you think you'd be like, okay, like in 2023, I'm exactly where I should be at. I'm behind schedule. I'm ahead of schedule. Uh, so what I think now when I, uh, I think I'm doing better than what I expected. Um, yes, that's a good thing. Yeah. 
And That's like, very good. I didn't expect like I would finish my PhD in three and a half years. Uh, like writing a scientific article was such a big deal to me. Like, oh, I, sh I should be like learning all these things and my name is going to be on a paper. And if I make a mistake, my name is going to be mocked forever and ever till the end of time which I could happen. I think it happened today too, if I said anything stupid, <laughs> but uh, uh, like I've done, and that's the story of life. I think the hard work that uh, sometimes their dreams become like very normal thing. And that now they have to define new dreams to achieve. And that, I think that's the beauty of life. Yes. Um, is there anything I sort of asked you that I didn't know anything else you want to talk about? Uh, There are a lot of things that we can talk about, think about, and talk. And uh, yeah, but you have the, the, the time of uh, two hours, though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to you like that. two hours just on Iran stuff, right? Yes, exactly. Actually, I wanted to I make that to point because I think not only Iran but Ukraine, yeah, yeah. Ukrainian people, um, all the wars, also in Middle East. Yeah, I think there are a lot of that's like most Americans like we're focused on Ukraine, but like, there's been a war in Sudan forever. There's stuff yeah. going on. I mean, Afghanistan, just... like it breaks much my, my heart so much about Afghanistan and their women or girls not yeah. being able to go to school, yeah. not being able to do anything. Like, um, unfortunately, it's sad but true that like the lives of different people matter differently. Yeah. Um, I wish it wasn't the case. I think we're on the right track mm -hmm. now that. I mean, we're talking about these things, and yeah. you bring that point up, which I appreciate it really. Uh, it's 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 a very important point. Yeah, there's some stuff going on in the world, and like like um I, like on the American news, it's to me just horrible, right? Like they bring stuff up, like what you know, like yeah. At the same time, like this is America, like people live in this country, yeah. so it it makes sense that the news media. I mean, whatever we're talking like some in, in entertainment people, like you know. So, so you shouldn't got married, right? You take a 10 minutes and you like, are you kidding me, right? Like, yes. go to CMZ for this, right? Like, yes. you know, and there's like stuff going on in you know, like own community, right? Like the homelessness in Seattle, emergency in Seattle, uh, you know, things going everywhere, you know, like, yeah, there's so much news, good and bad, right? And they focus on like entertainment, like 10 minutes. So and so got married or so and so got divorced. Like, like I'm sure people care, yeah. I guess, you know, but like, I have the exact same feeling as you're describing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but um, but I, it has its audience, so it does. Yeah, I mean, it's all about making a profit. Exactly. Know. Yeah, I usually watch. Uh, I like watching Al Jazeera. I think they're they're pretty good. Oh, I like yeah. Al Jazeera. I then. haven't watched it yet. But... Yeah, I like them. And then there's a thing called Ax Axios News. They're pretty good too. I think I've watched yeah. them quite a few times. Yes, they're good. Uh, now that reminds me of another like battlefield. For example, Yemen. Oh yeah, it's a battlefield between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Yeah. And it's, it's like, like proxy war, what do you want to call it? Yeah. And what have like the people done to them? Like their destiny of a huge amount it's of It's like they're being state. manipulated, you know? Yeah. Uh, so is it didn't Saudi Arabia ran like sign a kind of an agreement recently or they're trying yes. to get close to it? And I think that's not good news to the US because China was mediating between yeah. them yeah. and taking a dangerous role. And of course, it's probably not good news for Israel because now Israel, oh man, like, they're going to team up on us or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, like one of the big claims of the Islamic revolution was that we want to be independent. Mm -hmm. Like we're independent on the U S or the West or this and that, but now we're not independent. Mm -hmm. We're now dependent on Russia and China yeah. and just that's even worse. I mean, I, I personally prefer you. Yeah. They treat their uh, allies better. Russian people are not doing well either. No. Like I'm I'm sad about them too. Like people from Russia being booed in the sports field just yeah. because being Russian. Yeah. Like Putin does a lot of stupid stupid things, but that doesn't mean that Yeah, I had a lady on here a, a couple, like maybe two or three packs ago named Vlada. She just she moved her from Russia and her husband. She told me some of the stuff going on in Russia, like like man, it's like heartbreaking. Yes. Yeah, I like tennis and I watch tennis sometimes. And there's this guy. Medvedev, who plays I, I remember that. I remember that happening. And yeah. he gets booed everywhere. Yeah. And I think, like, the place that he's coming from is major reason. Yeah. Yeah. He used to have a t shirt. I don't support, you know, like, I'm against the war, yeah. you know, like something, right? Yeah. I think, but uh, yeah, uh, I think governments, 
play a dangerous game with each other and yeah. people play pay the price yeah of course you government most government sucks and the people have to pay the price you know most people get along right i mean regardless yeah. where they come from you know exactly yeah i mean i as an iranian with all these tensions between the u.s and americans with u.s and iran uh i've been i've been treated perfectly uh, i think the u.s is probably the only country in the world that embraces immigrants yeah. uh, with so much dignity and uh care and uh I think it's a two-way street. Uh, we try to give whatever we can to help build this country. And I think it's like the, the way that U.S. has been uh, formed, like, uh, and, and how... We're an immigrant country. Yes, and that's... Unfortunately, some Americans forget that. Yeah, and... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just grateful for the opportunity that, uh, like, uh, secular countries like this can provide. And I hope, I hope someday I can... See that government, similar government in Iran. Well, you're going to give us our free energy pretty soon. So that'd be, like, <laughs> that'd be, that'd be pay, payment enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, what advice do you have for immigrants coming here? What would you tell them they need to do or don't do? Uh, I mean, it can be easy. It, uh, it's sometimes it's very hard for people. Uh, like sometimes the chaos that is there, like you, you should be, I think, hardworking to make it work here. You, you, you can't just come here for fun. Um, and uh, not easy like my father sarcastically used to call me like a door that like they have a lot of emotion but I don't have any <laughs> so like some 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 guy like me is okay with the being distant from family but I know like, quite a few friends of mine who are not okay with that and they will come back and uh, and Iran is a great country to work in if the government allows you to have a free economy because there are a lot of resources and money flowing in that country. Um, so I, I think it doesn't have to be immigration for a lot of students. But uh, for me, it wasn't just the financial aspect of it. I think I could be fine in Iran, but just not being able to be myself, like the beliefs, I couldn't disclose what I believe in now. Uh, like, it, I mean, it's partly Islam too. Like if you leave your ideology or religion, you're, I think you should be executed by Islam. Anyway, yeah, all sorts of crazy things. So this is gonna be a very ignorant question, but like in Iran, can y'all like go up and see the city freely? Can you go like travel to different countries or you have to stay where you're at? No, they can. Uh, I mean, the country itself is free. And I mean, uh, before Islamic revolution, we didn't need visa for most of the countries because of the good relation we had with everybody. but. After that, because all these tensions, we need to get these up everywhere. But other than that, um, yeah, I mean, except the economy, which is downgrading more and more uh, as a result of um, some people call it old sanctions, but I don't think it's all sanctions. It's just mismanagement of the yeah, government. Some of it is government decisions. Yeah, uh, we still have a lot of money, but like, I mean, y'all are one of the biggest oil producing countries in the world, right? Yeah, oil and gas. Like, I think gas were number two or oil number three or four. And it's hard to see like this rich country having so much problems. And uh, I think it's the theocracy that is making us pay. Uh, yeah, one thing I don't know when people realize like, like so I, the leader used to be called the star, right? Yeah. The star Iran. I remember seeing pictures back in the 70s, like basically Iranians dressed like America. You see like, you see, like Iranian women, like short dresses, you know, like yeah. they were like Americanized. And then like a child came with like 180 degree chains. Yes, yeah, and I think like one example of adverse effect, effect of that is that we can't attract a lot of tourists we can claim. Like to, when tourists come to Iran, they're like amazed by the scenes they see. And I think it's, a, I mean, even if we didn't have the oil and gas, the tourism could, could be our main economic advantage. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the, the stupid policies. And, and I mean, if, if you are Muslim, and I respect, like my parents are Muslim, but they they they're fine by keeping that to themselves. Why should a government yeah. force that into other people? And I mean, it it in some sense it's a good thing to happen because it accelerated the the real perception of people from religion. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that this could take like hundreds of years, like what happened with. Uh, uh, Roman age and what 
um, popes were doing to people and the hard time that they had. And I think they had a horrible time too. And some people are expecting the same thing in Iran. But I think with this government, it got accelerated because it revealed to people how dangerous uh, theocratic regimes can yeah. be. And uh, this is, I don't think, totally a bad thing. Yeah, my thing is like, you know, with the religion, like, how you know whose God's true, right? Like, is it Christianity, Buddha? Like, if there's like one true God, if I could just come down and say, I'm God, do what I say, right? Yeah. How is this like, I could, I could make stuff like, I mean, who, who, who is it like, is the Roman God Neptune? He's the right one, you know? Yeah. Like, the Greek God, like, you know, there's yeah. all these gods, right? And why the one that I was born with is the right one? Yeah. I mean, definitely. If I, mean, I was born in Israel, yeah, I was being Jewish. If yeah. I was born in Brazil, I probably would be, be Christian. Be, be so lucky, right? It's talk about chance, you know. Like, so were you born at the terms you're going to heaven or hell, whatever the case may be, you know? Yeah. And Richard Dawkins has a very funny saying that, like, I'm atheist to mm -hmm. nine. Let's say we have ten thousand religions. We are yeah, nine hundred nine thousand yeah. nine hundred ninety nine yeah. religions. I'm yeah. atheist to. Yeah. Some of us go one religion further. Yeah. So. Yeah, I remember that quote. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and like you know, like Christianity is like you know, like, like have you read the Bible? Like an old, old Old Testament, like you no know, God said you no, know, do all these bad things to people, like kill people, right? You know, so like I don't know. It's... I mean, I I I don't want to uh, be judgmental about people's beliefs. Uh, I re I have a lot of friends who are Christians, mm -hmm. Jewish, and Muslim, and it has nothing to do. I mean, I as when I even when I was growing up as a Muslim, I was always thinking like. While I'm a Muslim, I can marry to anyone. Yeah. Although the religion says otherwise, but like, it's just a personal thing. Yeah. E even if you have that faith, it's it between you and your God. Yeah. My thing is, believe what you want to believe, but don't push it on someone else, right? You know. Exactly. Like, I'm a question. Maybe you want to like talk to them about, you know, and say, hey, I'm I'm this, I'm that, you know, so I'm, this, so I'm like this religion. Mm -hmm. But those people out there, like, you know, I'm, you know, ex religion. Do what I do. Do my religion or die and burn in hell, right? Like, yes. First of all, that's not your place, right? That's, that's God, God's place to do that, you know? Yeah, but I think in all these things, people are the victims. Yeah. Even even those, like the suicide bombers. Mm -hmm. First of all, I mean, they kill a lot of people, but they kill themselves too. Like, yeah. And that's a sad thing. And they, they they die with the belief that they're going to heaven. I mean... Hey, do you ever watch uh, Family Guy? Not really. So I, had, I had one episode where like, there was this, this terrorist bomber, right? Where they kill themselves, right? I'm gonna come out some of your 40 virgins. It was 40 <laughs> boy virgins. <laughs> like young 40 young teenage boys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's it's just it's like a story being told to a child mm -hmm. to convince, like, yeah. Yeah. You can talk about that for hours and hours. Definitely. So one more time. Is there anything that you want that I didn't ask you that you want to talk about? No, that was all. Uh, it was a really fun experience. Thank you for having me here. Yes. Um, That's my number one goal for people who say they had a fun time. Yes, it was definitely fun. And I hope we can have another time talking more in depth oh, yeah, about this. I didn't want to things. talk to you again. So um, is how can people reach out to you? Can you share your social media? Absolutely. Uh, I have my website, moinbore.com. There's my LinkedIn, which I can. I think you can share that mm -hmm. with people. And uh, there's my email, me at moinbore.com. They can reach out to also Avalanche Energy website. And uh, if you're interested in what we do, even if you don't have an opening position in our company, feel free to reach out. Uh, we have no boundaries. If we find some talented people that are excited and they can work with us, we're always open to hiring more people. So a very interesting question. Can someone like go to your company and like, hey, I want a tour, what y'all doing? Yeah, we're doing a lot of tours. Okay. Uh, but we have to know before. Oh yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. That's all, but yeah, definitely. We had a tour of uh, a few, folks from IEEE Seattle section, mm -hmm. uh, which Mike was one of them too. And uh, yeah, we're always happy to have people looking at our facility and I'm sure you're going to be safe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.